special domain in higher dimension. Yes, I would like to thank uh, Devraj, Diganto, and Shivaguru for organizing this wonderful program, and also for giving me this opportunity to speak here. So I'll be speaking on quadrature domains in higher dimensions. So in the first week of uh, the program, uh, Kaushal gave a series of lectures on quadrature domains in the planar case. And uh, in the initial part, I would just recall some of the uh, relevant theorems which are used in this particular talk. So let me first recall that uh, a domain is said to satisfy a quadrature identity if, so this is in the planar case right now, if we have a domain omega, uh, if we have points q1, q2 up to qp in omega and complex constant c, j, k such that for any function f in a given test class. So uh, I'll fix the test class once and for all for this talk. It will be the Bergman space of function. So the statement will read that if uh, you take any f in the Bergman space of functions, integral of f is a finite linear combination of the derivatives of f evaluated at fixed points. So the constants, the derivative, and the points do not depend on the function f. <clears throat> so this is a classical theory, and uh, uh, the first uh, exploits into this was probably in the 60s when uh, Epstein considered the simplest quadrature identity that we can think of, namely the mean value theorem, and studied when uh, what would be the impact of such a quadrature identity on the domain. And uh, Epstein and Schiffer studied it more. They dropped certain hypotheses, and I think it was proved in one of those lectures that uh, that will force the domain to be a disk centered at that particular point. And then later, uh, Aharonov and Shapiro systematically studied quadrature domains in 76. Gustafsson picked it up from there. And uh, Makoto Sakai, Mihai Putinar are amongst the people who did it in the 80s and 90s. I'm not naming everyone, but uh, the prominent people who worked in this. And Stephen Bell in the recent past, along with Kaushal. So yeah, so this is the. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll recall some of the statements which were uh, uh, which were visited upon in the first week. So this was the Epstein-Schiffer theorem that was discussed. It said that if you have a domain uh, whose uh, complement has a non-empty interior, and so in this talk, let's always fix every domain that we deal with as bounded domains. So this is in particular a redundant assumption. So if uh, u of a is one by area of omega times integral of u d sigma, then omega is a disk centered at A. Aharono and Shapiro later characterized all simply connected uh, quadrature domains in the plane. And uh, we now know that they are basically the image of the unit disk under rational maps, which are univalent on the unit disk, and whose poles are away from u bar or b01 bar, disk bar. And then the impact of the quadrature identity was also discussed extensively, I guess. Uh, we can realize the boundary as sitting inside the zero set of uh, irreducible polynomial over C with real coefficients. The one I would like to however stress upon is a density theorem. This was first proved in 82 by Gustafsson for bounded analytic curves and later by Bell for smoothly bounded domains. So the statement goes like this, if omega is a bounded domain in C with uh, finitely many bounded smooth curves now, then there are quadrature domains arbitrarily close to it. <clears throat> so with this, let me move over to quadrature domains in higher dimensions. And the first goal will be to look at a, a potential generalization of this final last statement that we have written down. So let me move over to quadrature domains in higher dimensions. So again, we'll only deal with bounded domains in CN. We'll say that a domain D in CN is a quadrature domain if it satisfies a quadrature identity. And a quadrature identity is what one would expect. So for every f in the uh, Bergman space, which is L2 holomorphic functions, integral of f is basically <clears throat> a finite uh, sum of uh, or rather finite linear combination of f alpha of qj where 
the cj alpha the derivative and qj are not dependent on f so this now just becomes a uh, multi index notation where f alpha basically means do mod alpha by do z1 alpha 1 up to do z1 alpha okay so the the first thing i would like to do is to get a recharacterization or a characterization of this this, this particular identity in the language of uh, bergman kernels which was introduced today in the morning by <coughs> professor kengo hirachi and uh, to do that let's focus on the let's focus on the what is our identity that we have what we have is integral of f so it's with respect to the volume measure this is finitely many points i bring in the bergman kernel by writing it as the inner product where this is the notation for evaluated at qj so taking this in this is just going to be the inner product of f with and the definition says that for all f in h2 so today morning it was denoted by a2 so I'll let me denote it by h2 h2 of d this particular identity satisfied this in particular we can realize as the inner product of f with 1 so i'll turn it down in the next slide anyway so what we have effectively obtained is that we can write 1 is This is what we have effectively obtained. <clears throat> so in other words, it's an if and only statement that we have proved what we have. What can be written on as a lemma? So let D be a domain. D is a quadrature domain if and only if one belongs to Okay, one belongs to what? So let me come to that. So we'll what we'll do is we'll take all these objects which are of this form. And then let's look at the complex linear span where W varies over the domain and alpha over Nn. The complex linear span of this. And we will call it the Bergman span. <clears throat> so the lemma will state that this is the case if and only if one belongs to the Bergman span of T. So in other words, uh, I can give an alternate definition and I'll demand that a domain is a quadrature domain if the constant function one belongs to the Bergman span of Bergman span associated to D. So I'll use this as the working definition for uh, quadrature domains from now. So the first few examples will be the <coughs> yeah. So the first one is the unit ball. We in fact saw the explicit expression for uh, the Bergman kernel there, and you can check that k z comma zero is a constant. And in the classical way, if you want to look at it, it's just the mean value theorem. The poly disk, so for, for the poly disk, I would like to make one observation that the Bergman kernel behaves well when it comes to product. If we have k uh, z1, z2, let me put it this way, where z1 is in d1 and z2 is in d2, this splits well. And because of this, what we will be able to do is write the Bergman kernel of polydisc explicitly. We can check again that one belongs to the Bergman span of the polydisc by checking that this is identically equal to one, or look at the Cauchy integral formula, whichever is 
the way you would like to look at it. Okay, the next one uh, of the examples I would like to concentrate on is complete circular domain. So what does a complete circular domain? We have a circle action. So for all lambda uh, in the unit disk, uh, closed unit disk, lambda dot z belongs to D whenever lambda uh, z belongs to D. <clears throat> so this completes, uh, uh, the complete circular domains are also examples of quadrature domains here. It's actually a, a beautiful argument which maybe I'd, I would like to run over. So, so the first observation is that the Bergman kernel behaves well under transformations, under biholomorphisms. So <clears throat> the first observation is that z going to e to the power i theta z. So this is the case when it is bounded complete circular. This is an automorphism of our domain D and the transformation formula tells us that if we have a biolomorphism from D1 to D2, then we have JF at Z, which is the Jacobian of F at Z, KD2, FZ, FW, times JF at W bar is equal to KD1 of Z compatibility. So with this, it can be checked that this uh, gives a formula of the type, the transformation formula of the type, K of lambda Z comma W is equal to K of Z comma lambda bar W, a bit with a bit of tweaking in the arguments where lambda belongs to S1. Okay, so let's uh, fix So let's fix uh, Z and W in D. Then there exists a neighborhood U of the closed unit disk such that uh, TZ and TW both belong to D for all T in U. It's after all a complete circular domain. And then if you look at this particular map, one is lambda going to K of lambda z and w, and the other one is lambda going to k of z lambda bar w. So the Bergman kernel is con uh, conjugate holomorphic in the second variable along with the holomorphist here. Both turn out to be holomorphic maps. And on S, so let's call it something phi1 and phi2. On S1, phi1 is equal to phi2. And by identity theorem, we get that k of lambda z W is K of Z lambda bar W for all lambda in U. So in particular, we can conclude that K of Z comma zero is identically equal to K of zero comma zero, a constant. So in other words, one is in the Bergman span. So this tells us that even complete circular domains are quadrature domains. A similar argument will tell us uh, that complete P1 to Pn circular domains are also quadrature domains. So I'll not spend more time, but I'll just tell what a P1 to Pn circular domain is. For every lambda in D bar, we have an action, which let me now define by a dot, bigger dot. This is whenever z belongs to d. And a similar argument can be given to show that this also is, 10 minutes, this also is a quadrature domain. So, but these are all very special quadrature domains. As you can see, all of them turn out to be 1.1 degree. In other words, it's, it's, it's around one point and not having any derivatives. So these are all very special. There are, however, more complicated examples which we can get from this particular observation. This is a simple statement. It says that if D1 and D2 are quadrature domains in C n1 and C n2 respectively, C n1 plus, uh, then D1 cross D2 is a quadrature domain if and only if D and D1 and D2 are respectively quadrature domains. 
<clears throat> so in particular, you take any quadrature identity. So the proof will reveal that the, the nodes will depend on the nodes of D1 and D2, the nodes of D1 cross D2, and you can get sufficiently complicated quadrature domains you want. Okay. So this particular statement was exploited very recently by Alan Legg, a student of Stephen Bell, to talk about some function theoretic properties. <clears throat> like to focus, however, on a density theorem, which uh, is a generalization of what was done in the uh, planar case. So the right class of domains that was conjectured where a density theorem would work was domains which satisfy condition R, which I have quickly recalled here. A domain is said to satisfy condition R if the Bergman projection preserves the space infinity of T bar. So we will consider only those domains which are of the type D cross omega, where D is in C n minus 1 a smoothly bounded pseudo convex domain which satisfies condition R. And omega is a smoothly bounded domain, which naturally satisfies condition R. So then the, pro, uh, the statement is that there exist quadrature domains arbitrarily close to d cross omega. Okay, so I have eight minutes, so I think I can run through a sketch of the proof. The key tool that is being used here is uh, good that I didn't erase this part. The key tool that is being used is this theorem. It says that if you have a biholomorphic mapping from D1 to D2, then D2 is a quadrature domain if and only if the Jacobian is in the Bergman span. So if you think about it, it can be thought of as a generalization of maybe this particular lemma, which just talks about the very special case when F is the identity self-map. So this is the key tool that we will be using in the uh, proof of this. So I'll not be able to do justice to this proof anyway, so I'll just try to give a, a, a broad sketch. So what? how can we use this particular key tool? We'll consider a very special type of map, or most, the most simplest map that comes to our head, which is of this type. F of z is, in the first variables, first n minus 1 variables, it's the components are just projection, and then it's G offset from a given domain. And then the Jacobian just turns out to be dou G by So if we start off with uh, an element U in the Bergman span of our given domain D, in, in our case D cross omega, and if we somehow manage to solve for this, and further, we ensure that this map F is a biholomorphism, or even this actually goes through for proper holomorphic mappings as well. So either way, if we can do that, we'll end up, okay, but we will insist on biholomorphisms here because we want it biholomorphic to our given domain, and we'll end up with domains which are biholomorphic to our given domain at least. That's so sort what of I have written here. But then that will not ensure any density, and that is where condition R comes in. So a domain <coughs> which satisfies condition R has some nice density properties by uh, Bell in 79. And subsequently, this statement is from the work in Lijoka's paper. So this says that uh, if our domain satisfies condition R, then the Bergman span is dense in A infinity of T which is C infinity of D bar intersected with O of T. <clears throat> so how do we use this? So to <clears throat> use this, the first observation should be that D1, uh, sorry, D cross omega, which is the setup we are in, D cross omega does satisfy condition R, but then we started off with D a condition, uh, domain which satisfies condition R, and omega a smoothly bounded domain. And by a recent work of Tebraj and Mechi Shaw, we know that, and subsequent work with Kaushal, it's known that if we take two condition R domains and look at its product, there will also be a condition R domain. And therefore, we have D cross omega will satisfy condition R, and we pick a function u, which is close to identity, the, not identity, the constant function 1, and try to solve for this particular 
PD there in D cross omega. That might not be doable if omega is not simply connected for, there might be periods. So we can do some correction and we can get another function small v, which is again in the Bergman span and close to the constant function one such that it can be solved by clearing of periods. So I'll not go into the details there. Subsequently, we'll get hold of, using Hartog's theorem, we'll get hold of a holomorphic function, which maps d cross omega into cn. And the fact that it is close to 1 will tell us that what, and we can arrange for the solution to be in such a manner that the solution is close to the identity mapping. And therefore, this image will then turn out to be a quadrature domain which is close to d cross omega. So that's the broad idea. Of course, I have not gone into any of the details. I can provide it maybe later if anybody is interested. Okay. So in the last uh, five minutes, maybe uh, I'd like to focus on a conjecture by Bell. So uh, if you recall, uh, Epstein Schiffer was a statement which talked about what is the impact of a uh, 1.1 degree quadrature identity in the planar case. It said that it's, it has to be a disk. There is no other choice. So Bell conjectured, so of, of course we have already seen that both the ball and the polydisk are 1.1 degree quadrature domain, so that cannot, be a, that cannot be a statement which we can make here. But then uh, Bell made a conjecture that they will all be biolomorphic to a complete circular domain. <clears throat> So 1.1 degree quadrature domains, I have already written down a few examples, there are more. So the first four actually are examples of 1.1 degree quadrature domains. And there are more actually. If you, so this is a class, yeah, this is the class of domains which I don't want to elaborate upon, is also another example, class of examples of 1.1 degree quadrature domains, wherein there is an automorphism, the, the, there is an action by a group which has invariant enter functions as constants and the domain is G invariant. There the Bergman kernel is necessarily of the type Kz, comma zero is a constant. So this is, if anybody is interested, it's there in a work in 2016 by Ning, Zhang and Zhu. Okay, so uh, why was this conjecture useful or important? Well, we could pull back uh, the multitude of results that we have on complete circular domains to 1.1 uh, degree quadrature domains, if we could establish that. And in that process, we realized that the conjecture is false and the following in a joint work with J.K. Jayakrishnan was uh, a counterexample to the conjecture. It said that there exist one, two quadrature domains which contain zero, but which is not biolomorphic to any complete circular domain. So to do that, uh, I'd like to, to, to give up, I, I'll be able to give an outline of the proof and maybe it can, I can do justice to the proof as well. This is a 1970 result in a German paper by Kopp, where he proves that if we have two P circular domains, which is exactly these, if you have a bounder, if you have a biolomorphic mapping from D1 to D2, then there also exists another biolomorphism, or maybe not another, but which fixes the origin. So all through this uh, talk, when a, uh, a complete circular or a complete P-circular was being mentioned, it was with respect to the origin. So we can find a biolomorphism which fixes zero. And then in a 2017 work, Ning and Zhu proved that if there are, say, two uh, Two P circular, no, two, one P circular domain and a P prime circular domain. And suppose F is a biolomorphism which fixes the origin, then they are necessarily a polynomial mapping, and we also know a bound on the uh, degree of each of the components, which is given by this formula here. With this, we consider the following domain. The domain is basically ZW, which is uh, satisfying this defining equation, mod z square plus mod w square plus mod z u plus w square the whole square less than 3. Yes, and uh, this is a simple check. We can check that minus 1, 1 is here and minus i, i doesn't belong there. It's not a complete circular domain in particular. And if it were to be a 
domain, which is biolome affect to a complete circular domain. Then let's call that function f, the biolomorphism f, from a complete circular domain omega to d, which fixes zero. Then this result, the previous, this, this result implies that by keeping track of the degrees that, we, that is involved, we'll be able to conclude that f has to be a linear mapping. But then d, we already checked is not a complete circular domain, and that gives a contradiction. And that establishes the contradiction. So yeah, so I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Any P1 to Pn circular domain I have shown is a quadrature domain. So this is a 2-3 oh, circular oh, domain. I see, I see, I see, I see. It's a 1.1 degree quadrature domain, in fact. Yeah. The proof basically runs through the same line of argument there. We just need to change the circle action by the twisted circle action. Yeah, I think it should be doable, but then we need to sit and write down. I, I, with, the, with the algorithm that has been prescribed, it should certainly be doable. Yeah. Is it in some way related to a circular domain? Uh, maybe there's a proper map or something like that? Uh, that I have not explored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it is. Maybe I should explore that. Apart from those product domains and domains with those special symmetries, do you have any other explicit examples of quadrature domains? It's generally difficult to come up with concrete examples, concrete examples of quadrature domains. So, uh, yeah, the density theorem provides us a lot, but yeah, we can. There is a method. So, uh, yeah, so we pull back under some nice polynomial mappings, which has a polynomial inverse and uh, Jacobian one, we pull back, say, a ball. Mm. Okay. Right. So as I was mentioning, the uh, theorem which was written, that goes through for several uh, It was written for several variables. I was mentioning it for biolomorphic mappings. It'll go through for proper holomorphic mappings as well. So you don't need a biolomorphism so to those start, those start those with. Those correspond to uh, multiple nodes. They'll have multiple nodes. We can write it down explicitly. Yeah, that'll give a large class of examples. Pick the nice polynomial mappings that comes to you. And L1, yes. We have the entire power of the Bergman space theory to work with. And it's not, not, not much information is lost. That's the reason. Maybe the correct conjecture is that they are like P, what you are calling P circular. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. That cannot be true, right? We have we have just no. proved it. I mean, we cannot. Ah, yeah. No, no. Maybe, maybe P for some vector P. Oh, but okay. Vector. For some P. Yeah. Correct. But there are some more examples. Things that are left invariant by some unitary group. Oh. Yeah, but we don't That's know the, whether they are biolomorphic to any of these or not. So. Conjecture should be unitary, maybe what you are saying. Oh, you need to some subgroup of yeah, that might be a good candidate. Is this written up? Yeah, it's so 2018. Is written up. Okay.